Dr. Martha Burns. She's a joint appointment professor at Northwestern University and has authored three books uh, and over 100 journal articles on the neuroscience of language and communication. Dr. Burns' expertise is in all areas related to the neuroscience of learning, such as language and reading in the brain, the language literacy continuum, and the adolescent brain. Dr. Burns is also a fellow of the American Speech Language Hearing Association and the Director of Neuroscience Education for Scientific Learning Corporation. Please help me welcome Dr. Martha Burns. Thank you, Carrie, and welcome everyone to Effects of Poverty on School Success. Um, I know, let's see, there we go. Whoops, we went to too many slides. Uh, we'll get this to come back a little bit. Not, okay. So the real 21st century problem in public education, and you all know that, um, is poverty. And uh, Elaine Weiss, who's with the um, who's actually with the Washington Post, wrote an editorial about this as early as 2013. Um, the increase in the number of students that we have in our schools of poverty is dramatically increasing. From the year 2000, about the half of the student body in four states were eligible for free and reduced meals just 11 years Later in 2011, over half the public school students in 17 states um, are students of poverty. And obviously, you are attending this webinar because that is something that is impacting you. Now, for me to be able to present well, I love to learn about my participants. So this is a poll question I'd like you to answer. You just click on the right answer for you, the appropriate one. I'd like to know what percentage of students of poverty you work with. Do you work with zero to 20 percent of your students have are students of poverty, uh, 20 to 50 percent, 50 to 75 percent, or more than 75 percent? Just go ahead and click on which of those buttons is appropriate for you and click the submit button. I'll give you just about a minute to do that. And then we will come back in, look at your results, and it helps me to know what kinds of, um, of audience I have in terms of the population of poverty that you're working with. So I'll give you one more minute, and then I'm going to just click on Submit, and I will go to the answer. And it looks like a lot of you, um, actually almost 40% of you have more than 75% of your students are students of poverty. And then the other 32%, um, about a third of you have over 50%. So that's very high poverty rate. So this is not something that's new to you then. The, this issue of poverty and the increase is something you're all facing. Now what I want to talk about is this vicious cycle of what happens to children and the way their brains develop when they are students of poverty. That's really what we're going to talk about. Alison Gopnik, you might know her. She's um, at Berkeley, and she's been speaking on the child brain development for many, many, many years. Is one of the leading experts. And she wrote an article just this May that a fifth or more of American children grow up in poverty and that that widening achievement gap in our schools is causing all sorts of effects on the way the brain develops. And so what we're going to cover today is that Children of poverty, number one, you may know this from the Hart and Risley research, are exposed to millions of fewer words, actually about 32 million fewer words before they enter school. That income level does negatively impact ability to learn, specifically cognitive skills, cognitive skills like memory and attention are really affected by uh, poverty. Poverty is associated with chronic stress. And again, if you read Eric Jensen's book or if you're aware of it, Teaching with Poverty in Mind, he talks a lot about the impact of poverty on learning, but also how poverty is associated with stress and the negative impacts of stress. And I'll show you that research too. And then we'll talk about how many children who are English language learners have a double jeopardy or even triple jeopardy. They do have poverty, high poverty rates oftentimes, as well as learning the second language in school. And then finally, we're going to talk about the use of computer-based activities, neuroscience computer games, that targets the skills impacted by poverty in ways that teachers can't in the classroom. So you can augment what the teacher does. 
So let's just begin with the Hart and Risley research. It was published in the 90s, as you know, and the book was Language Experiences of Young Children. And this is a graph that simply shows you um, along the horizontal axis you see we're looking at age up to 48 months. So we're looking at children from birth to 48 months and how much talking goes on in the home. If a child comes from your home, you are a professional, then that child is exposed to um, well over 40 million words. But if a child comes from a home below the poverty line, in the first four years of life, they're only exposed to 13 million words. That's a huge gap. Um, that's over 30 million fewer words that the child hears before they enter school. Now, the problem with that is that the brain is an experience-dependent organ. And so if the child is coming into school with fewer experiences with language, then their language skills obviously are affected, their oral language skills. And we know that research by Hirsch that you see in this slide showed that when children enter kindergarten with low oral language skills, the gap widens. Um, and that's largely because when they're sitting in a classroom, a lot of what the teacher is saying is going over their head. They're just not hearing it. They're not paying attention to it. They're tuning out a lot because the listening is not their strength. They don't have a brain that's good at language yet. And so they're not benefiting the way the students who have good language skills are from the classroom instruction, and hence their vocabulary gap just continues to get wider. But let's look at the impact of poverty on other skills besides language. We know from research that was done about 10 years ago by uh, Kimberly Noble that when children are below the poverty line, they also have, in addition to language, that's that big brown line that you see on this line graph or bar graph, but they also have problems with working memory and they have problems with cognitive control. And I want to explain those to you briefly. Working memory, you may know well, but that's your ability to hold information in mind. So it's your ability right now, because you're having to listen to me, to remember what I said five minutes ago and to hold on to what I'm saying now and keep it in mind as we progress through this session today. Cognitive control is the ability to pay attention to what I'm saying and to not tune out um, and to be to listen on demand. It also is other kinds of self-control. But listening on demand, being able to sit in a classroom, being able to say to yourself, I'm going to pay attention, I'm, not, I'm going to ignore the other things going around me, those are severely affected by uh, poverty. And we've known that for over 10 years. But now, in the last few years, we have even newer research. Just this last year, Kimberly Noble published another study where she looked at the thickness of the cortex, the thickness of the human brain, the outside crest of the human brain, which is where all the little dendrites are that connect up with other neurons in the cell bodies. And, and that thickness of the cortex is a rough measure of what you're good in. So, for example, if you're a really good artist, you would have a very thick visual cortex. If you were a, ver a musician, you would have a very thick cortex in the right auditory regions of your brain. And so, so thickness of the cortex kind of tells you how much experience you've had in something and also to some extent how good you are. And, and so she found when she looked at these measures of the cortex, a new kind of technology that's available, that small differences in income were associated with very large differences in this surface brain area. And that children from higher income families, children from your family and my family and Donald Trump's family, um, really have very, diff very little differences in our brains. So once you get above the poverty line, um, wealth doesn't seem to affect this cortical surface, but among po children of poverty it does. Now let's look at the specific structures that Noble found were affected or the parts of the brain that were affected by poverty. First and foremost, the language areas of the brain were not as well developed. Secondly, the reading area of the brain, that back couple of regions of, and tied to the language area, were not as well developed and weren't as, the surface area wasn't as large. 
executive functions, which is your ability to have self-control, to listen on demand, to remember everything that's going on around you, those aren't as well developed. And visual spatial skills aren't as well developed. And so it's not that the brains aren't as smart. It's not that the children's brains aren't developing. They are developing, but they're not developing in the areas that are important for learning in school. And Noble concluded that the research implies that income relates most strongly to brain structure among the very most disadvantaged students. And here I just put on a slide of a little homeless student, um, certainly among the most disadvantaged in our communities. Now, even later in April, of last year, <laughs> Dr. John Gabrielli, who's at MIT and has been looking at scans of dyslexia and, and all sorts of different developmental differences, uh, published research uh, that corroborates what no Noble showed. He showed that high income versus low income achievement differences directly correlate with with cortical thickness in adolescence. So he was looking even beyond just the young children that Noble was looking at and looking at the parts of the brain that are affected most by income level. And these are the regions of the brain, this is his slide, that are so important for school. But they're not important, it's interesting, for things like sports. And I'll explain that more later. The parts of the brain that you need to be good at sports um, are different kinds of skills, and those are not affected by poverty, which I find very interesting. Uh, Pollock also published research in June of this year that continued to corroborate this research, showing that t the t a 20 percent gap in test scores between poor children and middle class children seems to be related to the brain development in these specific parts of the brain that are important for learning. And then in October, um, so you can see all this research has been coming out very, very avidly, if you will. Another study that was done out of Gabrielli's lab by Leonard showed that that socioeconomic class specifically affects memory. That one of the biggest impacts is auditory memory, visual memory, and the ability to hold on to information. Um, and if there's anything you need to do well in school, we all know it's to remember and to hold on to what a teacher says and to what you've read. So socioeconomic class doesn't affect intelligence or ability to learn in general. Rather, it affects those kinds of learning important for academic success. Now let's ask ourselves why. Why would this be the case? Why would poverty affect just these parts of the brain so important for learning? And to explain this, we can go back to Jensen's book, Reading with Poverty in Mind, or this is some research out of Harvard University last year, uh, a, a paper that they published on the effects of stress and how stress affects and disrupts the architecture of the brain. Let's talk about this effect of stress and what it does. We all have been through stress. We have a lot of stress um, in our lives. This is a complex world that we grow in, up in. Um, but the neural circuits that deal with stress are very plastic during the very young stages of life, very malleable. So in a way, those first years of life, birth through four, your brain is trying to figure out what kind of world are you coming into. And if you're coming into a stressful world, the parts of your brain that deal with stress are going to grow and they're going to become more, more, um, more advanced in a way. They're going to become more responsive to stress, if you will. And so the regions involved in fear and anxiety and, and impulsively responding quickly without thinking things out are going to become stronger if you're in a stressful world. Whereas the regions that are dedicated to reasoning and planning and self-control and taking your time and patience are not going to be activated during those, those years, those early years of development. So if stress is very ongoing, if, if, if you have chronic stress, that's referred to as toxic stress. If you don't have any release from, relief from the stress at all, and that toxic stress then 
build your brain to respond at much lower thresholds to events that might not even be stressful to other people. Just a child who's been under a lot of stress, who's tapped on the shoulder, might just swing around and hit the person impulsively um, because they're so high tuned to this stress response. So it activates your stress response more frequently for longer periods of time and actually more quickly, which leads to behavior problems um, in a classroom where we want students <laughs> to be able to sit and listen and not be so overreactive. And over time, there's a lot of research now that shows that this wear and tear of toxic stress also increases the risk of stress-related physical and mental illness later in life. Now, finally, brand new research just came out a week ago um, on adverse childhood experiences in general. Adverse childhood experiences lead to stress, but they also lead to this, this problem of, of poverty or associated with poverty. And the adverse child experiences that, that Jimenez looked at um, are things like child maltreatment. Has, has the child experienced psychological maltreatment or neglect or physical maltreatment or sexual maltreatment? Has the child had come from a home where there's household dysfunction? Um, household dysfunction could be maternal depression or substance abuse in the home or incarceration of one of the parents or violence toward the mother. Or could the child have what we call um, just a combination of these effects? So if the child just had None of these adverse childhood experiences in this particular study by Jimenez of over a thousand children, you see about 45% had no adverse, adverse effects in their lives. But, but about a quarter of the children had one adverse uh, childhood experience and several of the children, 16%, 158 of the children had two adverse effects. Um, experiences, and then a smaller number, 25, um, through only 3% had four or more. But let's look at what those adverse effects do to the development of the brain, because certain poverty is, is, is part of this whole process. And keep in mind, and I want to remind everyone here, that this was a racially balanced population. So we're not looking at ethnicity, we're not looking at race here. A large proportion of these children were white in the study, a large proportion African American, large proportion other ethnicities. But overall, if they ask teachers to rate the academic skills of the students, based on how many of these adverse experiences they'd had, you can see that language and literacy was dramatically affected if children had two or three adverse experiences in their life prior to entering school. Um, science and social studies was also affected, not to the same degree as language and literacy, but then look at the effect on math. So mathematical skills and language and literacy skills are are very significantly affected by adverse experiences that children have in their environment. But more important, because teachers can't control this, is that attentional problems are more dramatic and social problems. So we have these cognitive problems as well as academic problems associated with adverse experiences, stress in the environment, which of course are all increased when we, come, when we talk about homes of poverty. The conclusion of Jimenez's research is that children experiencing adverse childhood experiences, it places them at significant risk for poor, poor school achievement, and it's also associated with poor health. So how about your ELL students? Many of you who have schools of high poverty also have schools um, with high proportions of students who are English language learners. And of course, English language learner enrollment has increased over the last 10 years as well. Hispanic children, for example, compensate a very urgent demographic imperative um, right now. Children who speak Spanish as their first language make up the largest proportion of English language learners in today's schools. But many of you also have high numbers of children who speak Arabic languages now or Asian languages now. So the 
problem is that especially Hispanic children, but some of these other populations as a group struggle with poor educational achievement because they also come from homes of high poverty. And they're also more likely to have experienced adverse childhood experiences. So when we go back to this ACES study of Jimenez, you can see that children who come from homes where Spanish is the first language make up a high proportion of the number of children who've had adverse experiences in early life. So this gets us to the solution, which is what you're all hoping for, I'm sure. And that is an article and much research that's been done on educational neuroscience. This article was published just a few months ago in the journal Neuron. And the title of it you can see is Neuroscience in the Future of Early Childhood Policy, Moving from Why to What and How. We know that the brain development is affected by poverty, by adverse experiences, and, and by, um, by stress, and that those often coalesce, what can we do about it? And that's where we want to get into solutions. The article talks about now that we know there are neuroscience-based interventions that we can do in our schools with our children to help boost these very capacities that are affected by poverty, by adverse experiences, and by stress. Number one, positive experiences after infancy have been shown to compensate for the negative behavioral um, consequences. So certainly we want an environment for our preschool children that's rich in opportunities for exploration and social play and also where they have caring and positive relationships with, with adults. But we also have the neuroscience developed um, computer activities that target the skills that are impacted by poverty and can turn around this brain maturational process in a way that's very difficult for teachers to do in the classroom. So the fast forward exercises, you may know, but they were developed by neuroscientists, specifically engage specific aspects of language so they build the language skills that Hart and Risley found are reduced in children of poverty. But they also were designed to build attention and memory skills of these children so that we can see the brains mature much more effectively and the adverse effects of poverty um, not as impactful. So let's come back to you. I want your insights here and, and some feedback um, from you again as we go into the rest of this, this talk. How confident are you that you can impact your students' academic growth? Are you, do you think that it's out of your hands and that you just kind of have the students and they come in with the problems and there's not much you can do or you're somewhat confident um, that you can help them but you'd like more tools or you're pretty confident that you that you can help these these children of poverty I'll give you just a minute to answer that question and then as soon as you've answered it please sub press the submit button and we'll look at the answer. And most of you say, yeah, I'm, I feel pretty confident that I can help to some degree, but you'd like more tools. Well, that's very helpful for me because let's talk about what some of those other tools are that can really help you. And in this case, we're going to talk about neuroscience technology, the fast forward programs. Well designed, designed neuroscience based technological programs build both the language skills and the cognitive skills. And I put this slide in to emphasize the fact that the fast forward programs are going to build working memory skills. I'm going to show you some demos of those activities and, and how those look. They're going to build attentional skills. They're going to improve the child's ability to listen on demand in your classroom and benefit from your instruction. They're going to include their, improve their processing speed and their ability to perceive you and to understand what you're saying. Um, and they're designed specifically in that way to build those underlying capacities that are very difficult for a teacher to do. Um, teachers kind of more or less depend on attention and memory, so building them through neuroscience can be very helpful. Now before I show you some demos, I just want to show you some of the outcomes um, that you get from neuroscience-based research. You remember the parts of the brain that are affected by poverty? Well, here you're looking at 
the results, the three slides show you the brain on the left is the brain of a child who has no problems with reading. The brain in the middle is in that I should say this is based on 35 typical students, what you see in the left, and you're looking at an fMRI scan of the left hemisphere, and you're looking at the red circle, which is the part of the brain that helps you to read aloud and build reading fluency, and the blue circle is the part of the brain that helps you for phonological awareness. It helps you to link sounds to letters. Um, and what you see in the middle slide, in the middle part of this slide, is reading impaired children, again, 35 of them, um, averaged across all of the students. And you see that they have less activation in the frontal lobe, the part of the brain that's important for both verbal fluency and reading fluency. And we would expect that. They would be very slow readers. But notice they have no activation where that blue circle is. Um, so their problems are with phonological awareness. You know that well. They can't link the sound to the letter very well. But after just six weeks of using the Fast Forward program, first of all, you see that that frontal lobe becomes much more active, and that improves their verbal fluency as well as reading fluency. Then you see the other part of their brain to become active is uh, the part of the brain, that blue circle that's very important for linking sound to letter. Um, we call that the angular gyrus. You also see that the green circle, an area that we, we didn't expect to see, but it's called the visual word form area. Their ability to visually perceive letters and words improves, as does um, the auditory temporal lobe area for listening skills. So these students, after six weeks of the fast forward language intervention, have those parts of the brain most affected by poverty actually activated and being able to be used in the the classroom to learn. Now, other independent research was done by Courtney Stevens at Oregon in Helen Neville's Language and Brain Lab, and they looked specifically just at attentional skills. And since attention is so affected, auditory attention especially, by poverty, they looked at children who had language impairments, and that's that first part of the bar graph, says LI. They looked at typically developing children. Again, this is a group of second graders, second graders who are typically developing, no reading problems, no listening problems, children who are language impaired, and then children who didn't go through any intervention at all. Um, and what you see is the white bar on each of these is lower um, in the language impaired children. The white bar is their ability to attend on demand, to listen to a teacher talk and pay attention. In this case, the task is they're listening to a story being read to them. And we're, we're measuring objectively with electrodes whether they're distracted by noises or, or words that don't belong in the story. And you can see that the language impaired children are very distracted before they go through fast forward. Typically developing children have much better skills, but both of them improved dramatically, significantly, that dark gray bar after they went through, again, six weeks of fast forward language, whereas the children who were just sitting in the classroom did not. So what we want to look at and what you care about is, okay, so this these fast forward, these neuroscience-based computer activities improve attention. We see that. We see that they help those parts of the brain that are affected by poverty. But do they have an outcome on academics? And this is research that was done in a school district um, in Louisiana, St. Mary's school district that has po high poverty level and high ELL students. And what I want you to notice here is they started using Fast Forward. They had a huge achievement gap, which many of our schools with high poverty have. And they, in 2006, they started using the Fast Forward program. And by 2008, they had closed the achievement gap entirely. That's that green line. And then they introduced that year um, Reading Assistant, which is a a, a corrective oral reading program that's done on a computer. And you can see the green line then continued to improve so that by the end of the uh, period of time, by 2009, these students had, had 
achieved way beyond uh, the um, statewide achievement levels, which are the the orange um, the orange line there. But I also want you to see that when we look at all academic skills in multiple subjects, that we see the students showed gains in their um, in in their other skills besides reading. So they showed improvement in their science skills. They showed improvement in their math skills and went above the achievement gap. And they and rose above, and even social studies. So in multiple subjects, because you improved attention and memory skills, these cognitive skills, that children are achieving and benefiting from classroom instruction. And most important, these children believe that they can get smarter, that, that intelligence isn't fixed, and that education achievement isn't fixed. So if you know Carol Dweck's research, you know she calls that, of course, um, that Raising smart children, this growth mindset of hers, raising smart kids depends upon them believing that you can get smarter and that school helps you get smarter. And one of the things Fast Forward really um, helps to do is improve that. So back to you again before I show our demos. What kind of reading interventions do you use now to help your students of poverty? Um, are you using small group reading intervention with um, supplementary pen and paper, paper activities? Are you using computer-based interventions right now? Um, are you not using any special interventions? All of your students are receiving the same instruction um, and you're not, you don't have a specific intervention for your students or at this time just nothing, that you're really just looking for something. So check out the answer that's most appropriate for you please and just press the submit button. And we'll look at your answer to that question. I'll give you just a minute here. Okay, so most of you are using small group reading intervention with paper pencil activities, and a few of you, a third of you, are using computer-based interventions. Um, so that's, you're very familiar with using computers, that's helpful, so, um, uh, and you're already using technology to supplement some of you. Let's ask one more question of you, how effective are your reading interventions? Um, are you just not sure yet? Do you think they're working out really well for all your students? That they're not working as well as you'd hope and you would like to try something new? Um, or they're working for some students but continue to have other students that they just don't seem to be effective for? Take a, just a minute to read those answers. Again, how effectively are your reading interventions? As soon as you answer that, press the Submit button, and we'll take a look here. Um, and that's pretty typical um, of an answer. Almost all of you said that they're working for some students, but some are continuing to struggle. And a few of you are saying, I, I'm not even sure how effective mine are. A few of you feel pretty confident with what you're, you're using, so that's tremendous, and you're getting some good results. So what I'm going to do now is I want to just demonstrate the fast forward interventions and show you how they're different probably from what else you're using and also to get you a feeling of how they aren't the kinds of things that a classroom teacher does. So um, and the even small group activities are going to be very different. So to do this I just shared my screen. And the first thing that I'm going to share with you, this is a reading activity. Um, Dr. Um, Burns, so, Dr. Yeah. Burns, if you could share, yeah. share it, that would be great. Click the play oh, button. Oh, right. Okay. Don't have the share on yet. You're right. Here we go. No. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> Almost have this down. So the first thing we're going to look at is a reading activity that many would be very familiar to many of you, and if you use small group activities, you're familiar with activities like this. Um, but I want to show you how this, this neuroscience-based technology that works on attention and memory is going to differ from what you do. This is a sight word vocabulary activity, recognizing sight words, but unlike paper pencil or small group activities, what's going to happen is the students are going to click on um, 
their, the start button, and they're going to have a penguin, and the penguin is going to say a word for them, and they're going to see the word and hear the word at the same time. The word, first one you're going to see is the word was, and then you'll see once the child identifies that, then you'll see another word, he. And that penguin says the word, and then words fly across the page, left to right, and the child has to maintain their attention, remember what they saw and heard, because they don't get to see it again, and it's not going to stay up there, and then they have to click on that match when it comes by. Then, in a later level, after they've mastered that, they will hear and see the word, but the word will just flash across the page. They won't hear it the second time. And this shows you how you can work on attention and memory with an activity on the computer in a way you could never do it in the classroom. So here we go. I'm going to turn it on, and you'll be able to watch this. Was, for, are, they, was. Now the child's going to have to remember what they heard. They won't get to hear it again. Walk. Run. So you can see that an activity like that works on left-right discrimination and um, tracking from left to right, as well as word recognition, as well as auditory attentional skills. And a teacher would have a very hard time building activities like that into the classroom to work both on attention and memory. Now I want to show you a different one. This is in our language series, and what I want you to see is in this one, the child is only working on auditory skills um, in this particular uh, example. I also want to, this is what you're going to see when you go to our webpage. If you want to look at more of the demos, you're going to get to the webpage, click on the demo um, icon there, and you have all sorts of products you can look at. I want you to notice a few things about this. There are seven exercises. On the other one that was reading one, our reading, one of our reading um, series, you got six exercises. Here a child gets seven exercises. They're going to be doing seven of these kinds of activities each day. But I'm just going to show you one that a child would get that really shows you how you can work on memory in a way and attention, but memory, especially auditory memory, those listening skills students have to have to be able to um, function in your classroom. And in a way that a teacher would really never be able to do through classroom activities or through small group activities. What you're going to see here, it's called Whaley and Match, and it's like a concentration game. You're all familiar with concentration, and you may even play that on a computer sometimes. But if we do it with a deck of cards, you know you lay the cards face down, person turns over a card, and then they have to find a match. And what's going to happen in Whaley and Match is it's going to be like that, except they're going to be little fish that the student sees. And they're not going to be able to see anything in this case, because we're trying to build auditory memory and auditory attention, those skills children need in a classroom. So what's going to happen is the child's going to hear words. They're going to hear, you'll see the, they'll, as they go across, and click on a fish, they're going to hear a word like was or cut or tug. And the words are going to be very similar to each other. So the child has to listen very carefully. And they have to listen for a match. And then when they get the match, they have to go back and confirm that they know which one matched. And then they get, they get a little reward, and then they start all over again. So I'm going to show you that activity right now. And we'll go in here. And this is exactly what you would do if you wanted to see the demos.
talk. Now notice a few things. The student didn't get any visual cues. So we're really stressing auditory attention and memory. And notice also that they get hundreds of repetitions in a very short period of time. So it's a way to really drive through experience these very skills affected so much by stress and poverty um, in a way that you couldn't do through regular classroom activities. So Carrie, you can go ahead and go back to the um, presentation for us. Yep. And there. the products again, thank you, are the Fast Forward and the Reading Assistant products. Um, and Fast Forward builds the auditory skills and the memory skills as well as reading and language skills. And then the Reading Assistant, I just want to explain again, is a oral reading product that children is on a computer, children have a headset, and they hear passages from books read, and then they read them aloud into the computer, and it has, um, it has assistive technology so that if they read a word incorrectly, it corrects them. So it's corrected oral reading, um, assisted oral reading, just like you would have in your reading groups, but children can do it independently on a computer during their own time. And so when you pair those two kinds of um, programs together in this neuroscience-based technology, you can have very dramatic effects on children's learning capacity in the classroom that supplements and augments all of the excellent teaching that you're doing. Now, after the webinar, if you want more information, you can go to with questions to webinars at scilearn.com. You can also go to the scientific learning website. That's where you saw me go. You can go in and click on products and actually see the same demos I showed you, plus demos of all the other um, exercises that are available. And you can request a personalized demo yourself. So now we'll open it up for questions. And uh, Carrie, you can let me know which questions. Yep, I've got a few people actually asking about middle schoolers um, and are the fast forward products appropriate for middle school age children and what kind of success do we see with that age range? Okay, that's a great question. Um, first of all, I didn't show you the middle school and high school demos. Um, we didn't have a lot of time, but you can certainly go to the website and look at those demos yourself. But the Fast Forward programs, there are 11 programs altogether in Fast Forward, and several of them are two of the language programs are specifically developed for middle and high school students. And the more advanced reading exercises I even use for things like uh, preparation to take the ACTs and the SATs for high school grads. So they go up to very advanced levels. That's number one. Reading Assistant has Lexile levels all the way up through high school levels as well. So the programs are appropriate with different kinds of graphics that are designed to appeal more to middle and high school students as you get to your older student range. So good question. Okay, and um, this, this was a really good question because we didn't really talk too much about this. Um, how, how do our products uh, work on reading comprehension? All right, um, they, we have actually outstanding uh, significant results with reading comprehension. The very first studies that were done of Fast Forward, that study that I showed you of the brains changing um, that was done, was done by Elise Temple at Stanford University and then replicated again by Nadine Gabe um, at Harvard University. And those brain changes that you saw were correlated with Woodcock-Johnson uh, reading comprehension score gains. So the Fast Forward products build reading comprehension, they build language comprehension skills, um, and those were the original uses of the products, uh, but they also at the same time simultaneously are building attention and memory and processing speed skills. Okay, next question, is this a program, is this program available as an app on, say, iPad, on an iPad? 
Yes, you can. It is available on tablets as an app, and um, you order the product first, and then you download the app, and you can use it on an iPad or, or other tablets too. Okay, and then um, someone I think is misunderstanding us. Um, I just want to clarify that, and I can have Dr. Burns address this as well, that we are appropriate for high school students. Um, so, uh, Dr. Burns, can you talk a little bit about how we're, um, you know, geared towards high school students as well? Yes. Um, the programs, uh, there are 11 programs altogether in the Fast Forward series, and then the Reading Assistant has Lexile levels all the way through high school level reading materials. And I will say that the data that we have on from schools, some of the best data we have is actually with high school level students. Students in in the lower grades, elementary grades, we get an average of one and a half year gain um, in reading comprehension and academic skills after using our products for about six months. Whereas in high school, we get average gains of two to two and a half years. So the fast forward products are even more effective in some respects in the high school students, in the older students, probably because they have benefited from classroom instruction, but their memory and attention skills interfere with their ability to take standardized tests to show you how much they know, but also their reading comprehension and speed and fluency improve so that they can read and, and perform so much more accurately and faster. Okay. Um, next questions. I've got. I've gotten a few questions about cost, and there's varying um, levels of cost depending on whether you're using it um, at a school or privately at home. So if you could just email me about cost, that would be great. And you can email me at webinars at scilearn.com. I am getting cost questions, and um, it'll depend on your your individual situation. Um, and then I've got other questions. Um, will, would this be considered a supplemental program for speech language therapy, or is it considered a skilled intervention provided to the student? Oh, okay. It can. It's actually both. <laughs> yes. So um, I am a speech language pathologist, and I use Fast Forward to supplement my speech and language intervention. So when I have students who come to me who have um, auditory processing problems, receptive language problems, as well as, let's say, reading problems, I often put them on the Fast Forward program. That is something that they do on their own very often at home, three or four days a week, and then maybe with me. And then I am also doing my my speech and language intervention. And I'll, I'll say the same thing for classroom intervention, that fast forward makes what the classroom teacher does work better. Children listen better, they learn better on demand, they remember more of what goes on in the classroom, and they benefit more from the programs that you're using, other intervention programs that you're using. So, so you can think of it as they make what you do work better because they improve attention skills and memory skills, which makes everything you're doing more effective. Okay, and then we got a question, and um, we should have mentioned this in the presentation. What are the protocols? for the product? How many minutes Oh, day, good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have protocols um, for 30 minutes a day, five days a week, that we recommend for students who are significantly below grade level in reading and listening uh, uh, skills. And then we have we can go down to protocols that are three days a week, 30 minutes, three days a week, uh, for students who are English language learners or students that just don't need the intensive intervention. And you can go up higher if you want. So you can go up as far as 90 minutes a day if you're, let's say, a speech language pathologist who has a child who's four or five years delayed and you really want to get a more, a bigger impact faster. Okay. And what is the ideal group size to use this program with or is it more one-on-one? -on -one? It is one-on-one. -on -one. Children are u are using it in the, on a computer individually. So all of these are designed for children to use by themselves 
with a computer um, or with their iPad or whatever. They can do it at home. They can do it in the school. They can do it two days a week at school, three days a week at home on a tablet. But it is individualized, and it adapts individually to every student as they go through it. So every student you put on it will be at a different stage and a different level within just a few days of using it. And then can you do group work, like have a group, like on a, you know, say kids go to a computer lab? Yes, you can do computer labs, you can do groups, of course. But each child would be on their own computer, yeah. Oh, right, 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 right. Okay, and then the next question, this is really interesting. Um, have we, do we have any information about using fast forward in rehabilitation work following, say, a stroke or um, some some other brain injury or um, you know, something like that? Yes. So what I teach at Northwestern, I'm on faculty at Northwestern, and the course I teach is traumatic brain injury and stroke. Um, and I, I teach it to medical students and psychology students, in, and it is a master's level program. Um, and we have used Fast Forward with patients who have traumatic brain injury, especially to improve their working memory and their language skills and their processing speed. And it was studied actually um, several years ago for aphasia, which is the language problem that results from stroke. Um, it was studied at University of um, in San Francisco at the San Francisco VA with stroke patients who have aphasia. And that paper was published in the journal Brain and Language. And they showed um, with patients with aphasia, significant improvements in auditory language comprehension after they went through what would be our fast-forward middle school program. Great. Uh, next question, is it an Internet-based application or does it require a software download? It is Internet-based. It used okay, to require wonderful. a mm -hmm. CD, but now it all can be done on the Internet. Great. Um, the next question I have, is a license given to the school district or is it to each individual child? You can do it either way. So that's why Carrie couldn't answer the question about price. So we have, one, mm -hmm. we have three models. One model is school districts purchase it through licenses at their school or district. We have a, another model where, where family members um, and therapists can purchase an individual program for a child or a year, it's actually, they're purchasing all access to all the programs, but they do it for a year for a specific child. And then we have something where we provide the intervention for the students, the scientific learning company provides it through something called Brain Pro, where we have uh, tutors that work with families and work with a child in a home, and the family can go to Brain Pro, to a Brain Pro, and they get the use of the product through the Brain Pro. So there are those three different models. And then, great. And then the next question is, is there a way to track comprehension success in your students? Uh, regardless oh, of wow. age in the program? Mm -hmm. Great question. Yes, we have, there is a, a uh, test that, uh, that the child takes before they start the programs and is administered periodically during the use of the programs. It's called Reading Progress Indicator, and it shows their improvements in phonological awareness skills, uh, to some extent their improvement in, in reading comprehension skills to a great extent, phonological awareness skills, and then to some extent language comprehension. But there isn't a built-in separate language comprehension test. Okay. And then this, this actually is a really good question uh, that came in. Um, and, and I don't know how closely we've looked at this. Um, was poverty the only factor used in this research, or have other factors been ruled out or considered, you know, such as parents' attitude towards and, and, and different factors that um, might impact all of this? That's, that is a wonderful question. I'm so glad that person asked it. Um, in the Noble study, what they did is they, they balance, and they've done this also in the adverse effects study that you saw, um, but they're, balance, they're very careful to balance across not just poverty lines, but also other aspects of um, home life, like uh, like ethnicity, 
um, and, the, and whether the child is in an urban environment or a rural environment. Um, and they do look to some extent, Noble has looked to some extent, and so has the, um, there's a separate study I didn't even include here that looks at other factors in the home, like is there a single parent, is the parent a high school graduate or not. Um, but those factors are all built in and controlled in these studies because what they're trying to do is say what is the effect of poverty irrespective of whether a parent is working three jobs and has no other parent in the home or and and so you as if you go to the studies on poverty you'll see they're working very hard to control for all of those other factors that could um, it could factor into how a child is responding in the classroom. But remember, the poverty studies are looking at the brain. So a parent's attitude toward education, per se, probably isn't going to be as influential to how the brain matures as would be how much the parent talks to the child, how many experiences the child has with being read to, things like that. Okay, and here's a, here's a good question. Um, do you have a comparison with Fast Forward Daily compared to simply reading with an adult daily? Uh, no, a that's a really, yeah. yeah, that's a really good question um, because, because, the, because reading to children is a wonderful thing. And so any children who get read to a lot um, are benefiting tremendously from that experience. They're getting parent attention, they're getting language input, and they're also getting exposure to language. Uh, so reading aloud to children is very helpful. But I doubt that it would improve attentional skills or memory skills in a formal way. It would certainly improve academic readiness, and we do know that. And there has been quite a mm -hmm. bit of research on reading to children and the benefits of it. Okay, and do we have an app for Chromebooks? I know Chromebooks are used um, by, various, by various people um, with our products, but do you know that answer specifically? I don't know if there's an actual app for Chromebooks. I know we have an iPad mm -hmm. app, I just don't know, but they certainly um, can call uh, our, the main number or go online and see if there's an app for a Chromebook. It, but Chromebooks can be used, Fast Forward can be used on Chromebooks, so. Mm -hmm. That yep. I do and know. Feel free. Yeah, and that person can reach out to me at webinars at scilearn.com, and I can get you more okay. information about and you, that. Yeah, you can go um, to tech support about whether there's an actual app. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then um, this is a good question. Do we have any math comprehension games? And, and, and another question along that same lines is, do we impact math skills? Okay, and the answer to that is yes, we do impact math skills. I will go back to the slide. I went through it so quickly that you may not have noticed it, but I'm going to just sit back here just to show you this slide um, that shows you the impact on math scores. So what you're seeing here, this is science, but the, the lower left-hand corner is the effect of using fast forward in this school district. The green line is the... Um, is the St. Mary's Parish, and you, in the orange line in that lower left-hand corner graph is the state, or the, sorry, the whole district average of scores. No, I think it's actually the state scores. And what you're seeing is the green line after they introduced Fast Forward in that kind of orange area, the students' math skills actually went above, over and above the skills uh, um, for the state average and then continue to grow. So fast forward does impact math. It probably impacts math because the children's language and processing goes up and attention and memory goes up so that they're just benefiting more from math instruction because the program itself does not have direct math instruction. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, then this will be our, our last question. If we haven't gotten to your question, please feel free to email me at webinars at scilearn.com. And the last question is, how long after initiating the program can you see progress? So far, I mean, if you look at these slides that are still up, you see progress continue over several months and years. Um, we have a few longitudinal studies that show the progress is ongoing and continues after the students use it, that it isn't just a, a bump and then the mm -hmm. children level back down. So. So far, we get that the results are enduring. They're fast and they're enduring, probably because they improve um, how, learning. Yeah. 
And, and um, how long after initiating the program? So say you start kids today, um, when might you see some progress um, that the children are making? Usually, okay, usually you see progress. You'll see them pay better attention in the classroom um, and be more responsive in the classroom, usually about three to four months after you initiate the program. But you start seeing test score changes and you start seeing academic changes usually six to eight months after you start using the program. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, that'll be our last question for today. I want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, again, please feel free to email us um, at webinars at scilearn.com if we didn't get to your questions or if you have additional questions. I want to thank Dr. Burns for being here today. I also wanted to remind everyone we are uh, partnering up with Eric Jensen this year. Um, he is well known for his work with brain-based learning and the author of Teaching with Poverty in Mind. He'll be providing three webinars throughout the year. Our first one's coming up on February 24th, and we'll give you more information on that. And I, again, thank you, Dr. Burns, for joining us, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, thank you. and thank you, Carrie. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.